Good morning. I um, also grew up, it's pretty hot here. Uh, I also uh, spent a lot of time hiking and camping in the Appalachian Mountains as a kid. But I grew up in Washington, D.C., and I'm a city person. So I had the opportunity for sort of a dream job combining my passions. When I graduated uh, with my PhD, I went to the American Museum of Natural History in New York City, where I had the opportunity to start a mapping laboratory where we could take satellite information and computer maps to help conservation organizations around the world think about what land to set aside to protect species and ecosystems around the planet. Well, I arrived on September 4th, 2001, and a week later, I found myself like I probably everyone in the room and people all over the world kind of thinking, what does this mean? What does September 11th mean to you? For me, what it meant was thinking about how can we reach across different ways of seeing the world? People in different cultures carry a different vision of what it means to live on their plot of ground. And what I wanted to share was a sense of what we all share, which is one planet. So what I'm going to do today is help all of you see some core data about our planet, but experience it. So before we start, let's just take a breath and maybe exhale. Breathe in. Now, people from cultures all over the world know that when you pay attention to your breath, your heart starts to settle, your pulse steadies out, your brain settles down, and your breath becomes steady. And it's that just awareness of the basic living conditions for health that I want to help all of us share and understand about our planet. Scientists have ways of studying and understanding the planet from on the ground to up in space. And these different technologies are really extensions of all of our perceptions that we can share by using visual information, taking the data that scientists capture and rendering it into something beautiful that we can all experience is a way for people to see complex information and take in a huge amount of data very quickly. And that's what we're going to do here. First, let's think about our lungs. Our lungs bring in oxygen and exhale carbon dioxide. This is the gas exchange that our bodies depend on. Well, we can visualize that on a planetary scale as well. And here in this map, you can see the greening up of North America and the ocean around it in the springtime, in the summer. And those are, that's due to plants taking in carbon dioxide and releasing CO2. And this is a seasonal pattern, just like our breath, of breathing in and out. As we pan across the western United States, bring your attention to the Pacific Ocean and the Bering Sea up as it is revealed up here by Alaska. The huge bloom of microscopic plants in the ocean there is responsible for food webs and energy that produce half the fish caught and fed in the United States. So it's really these microscopic plants that provide us not just the food we eat, but also the air we breathe. Half the air we, half the oxygen that we breathe comes from the global ocean. We all think about plants on land as being the big engines of, of oxygen, but don't forget those microscopic plants that cover 70% of the planet, that bloom in seasonal cycles, that provide us the air we breathe and the protein we rely on for food. The heart is what helps our circulatory system function. It's what distributes those nutrients and energy around our, our body. Earth has a circulatory system in the form of the ocean and atmosphere. The ocean circulates heat 
and energy around the planet and the atmosphere transfers that ocean energy up into the air and to the high latitudes. And we can see that by looking at cloud data. Clouds really do show us how Earth's circulation system works. And if you look here in the Western Pacific, during the La Nina that was happening during spring, you can see that there was increased activity in this band of clouds feeding into northern North America. And that's what led to a huge amount of flooding up here in the Missouri River Basin in the spring, as well as the dry conditions in Texas. So we really are connected in what we experience in a local place to what's happening thousands of miles away in the Earth system. And it's the circulatory system of our planet that helps us realize that. And you can see these data yourself and experience it for yourself. Just another snapshot of that in simplified view shows how that connection for across thousands of miles works. Last, let's think about the brain and the neurons and the nervous system in our body. That's how our body communicates with itself. If something's going on in your foot and you need to wake it up, you shake it because you get a little impulse. Well, humans have that capacity on a global scale now. And it's because we have a connected transportation and communication system. Every day, we have airplanes that take off from airports at various times, and it really tracks uh, the day-night Terminator. So over here, you're going to see daytime coming to Europe and a hive of activity happening in all the airports across Europe. That really shows us how dependent we are on cultures and people all over the planet because we take these great efforts to travel to different places just so we can meet face to face or do something in person. The connection among cultures is also a reminder that we use and depend on ecosystems and cultures and people all across this planet for our, for our existence for the things we take for granted, perhaps even, that we buy in the grocery store, our fruit that comes from Argentina, and our computers that come from China. And this is a good visualization to remind us that our transportation network really is global. Of course, also our communication networks are what really have taken off this generation. This is a generation of people who are more connected globally in actual thoughts, in actual communication, than any other generation of humanity. We all know this because the devices in your pockets and the computers you all use and the telephones we've all used. It's our ability to communicate on a planetary scale that gives me the greatest sense of opportunity to help people work together and imagine how good ideas can spread and come up with ways to approach global issues from a local level. Before moving on and concluding, I want you to also, also to understand that these data come from extensions of our own technology and perceptions. So here we see an, a satellite orbiting Earth, collecting reflected radiation from the planet. What happens when a satellite passes over a plot of ground and collects the radiated, the reflected energy is different bands of energy are separated based on the wavelength of the electromagnetic spectrum that they target. And different wavelengths of energy tell us different properties of, the, of things on the ground. So we can map where there's water, where there's a field, where there's a forest. And using this technology, we can construct images not just of what is happening today, but also we can go back in time and look at changes in the landscape. Over the past 30 years, the biggest driver of change in ecosystems on the planet by far has been our movement and utilization of resources, clearing of forests, building of roads, getting access to 
new resources all the time. And that's directly connected, we know, from our communication and transportation networks to the products we buy and consume. This has tremendous importance in terms of our connection to ecosystems, not just in our backyard, but around the planet. I wanted to share these three, these are these three ways of seeing the world with you, because they're touchstones for me. I've literally made and worked on hundreds of visualizations about the Earth system in topic areas that are, go from very specific scientific visualizations for a small group of people to visualizations that I publish just for people like you through the American Museum of Natural History and NOAA's climate.gov website. And my motivation, it always comes back to understanding Earth as one system. So these examples, I hope, help you experience what it is about our planet that is, connects us in terms of the exchange of energy across on a planetary basis, our dependence on the living world for the food we eat, for the oxygen we breathe, and our capacity as incredibly intelligent organisms to take in this information and conceive of a world where we approach the complexity of, this, of the problems we're face, faced with both from our local native intelligence and our working across the table with people with different perspectives to learn what they have to offer. And those are the motivations of the Worldviews Network, where we are deliberately saying, we don't have all the answers. We have all these great scientific data that help us all share one view of this one planet. And let's use that as a common framework for something we all know is vital to our future and the future of our children and grandchildren. It's that spirit of seeing first that will help us know more about the problems and issues we're facing and then do something. So see no do is in many ways our mantra. And for me, that's the essence of Katua that I want to share. That's the sacred place where we can come together and value the ecosystem services that are important for all of our lives.